Okay, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is um, Owen Gaffney from Future Earth and from Stockholm Resilience Centre. Uh, so welcome to this, uh, this session on the Anthropocene, geosciences in the Anthropocene. I'd like to thank uh, conveners, uh, Nick Arndt, uh, the chair of the Outreach Committee, and the co-conveners, Helmut uh, Weissert, uh, the SSP Division President of EGU, and Wouter uh, Berghus, uh, EGU Early Career Scientist Representative. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief um, overview uh, before, before we talk um, about the, the session, or before we go into the talks, um, which will be split into, into two. We'll have an hour and a half of um, talks, then followed by a 30-minute break, and then uh, and the next, uh, the final part of the session. So, so this, is a, this is a big week uh, in the Anthropocene. Uh, the, the Anthropocene Working Group uh, meet in Oslo on Friday, and uh, it looks like they'll make a, uh, a recommendation to the International Commission on Stratigraphy Subcommittee on the Quaternary, and it's, uh, it's likely they'll say we are in the Anthropocene, and it's likely they will specify a time that, uh, when the Anthropocene begins. Um, and then this International Committee will then consider the recommendation, at some point decide um, what we do with it, whether we adopt it, um, ask for more information, reject it, or, or, or some other. And I'm sure some of the speakers will, uh, will discuss um, uh, this today. Um, but, you know, uh, the Anthropocene is not just a description of the state of the earth, um, it is also a, a, a normative turn, um, and it matters to more people than just ge geologists and beyond the earth system science community. Um, into the social sciences, uh, governance experts and others are poring over the idea uh, the Anthropocene is, is politically loaded, as our final sp speaker Simon Lewis I'm sure will say, it's economically loaded. Um, our economic systems were based on pre-Anthropocene thinking. Uh, we need Anthropocene economics. It's also culturally loaded, so societally loaded, legally loaded. Um, and this is why the media is now fascinated with this um, arcane area of, um, of geology. Uh, and we have journalists and writers here speaking about uh, the Anthropocene. We have Guy Vince and, uh, and Andrew Revkin. Uh, so Berlin has become a, a focus of intellectual thinking in the humanities on the Anthropocene. Uh, we've had the Anthropocene campus there, uh, bringing together historians, architects, lawyers, writers, philosophers, uh, mulling over a broad range of topics to take in geopolitics, art, design, the notions of the technosphere and technofossils, uh, leading to philosophical questions about our place in the world. You know, whose Anthropocene is it, as uh, Libby Robin will discuss? Uh, and should it even be called to the Anthropocene? Should it be called the Capitalocene or the, um, the Anglocene or the Paleoanthropocene or the Misanthropocene and um, all these ideas? The, um, so, uh, and the Manocene. Um, or is it more than, uh, or, or is this more, more like a machine age? Um, uh, you know, some people have been suggesting that we all know more than the sexual organs of machines. Um, so, is the Anthropocene comparable to, um, you know, Copernican's heliocentricity or Darwinian evolution, as some people say, or is it more like a pop culture, another word for, for contemporary and modernism? Uh, every generation throws a hero up the pop chart, as uh, Paul Simon saying. Uh, every generation throws up a new concept to define that generation, and maybe this is Generation Anthropocene. So even without formal acceptance of the term, four academic journals have launched in the last four years um, using the concept of the Anthropocene. Uh, the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene Review, uh, Elementa, Science of the Anthropocene, Earth's Future, and another, another journal launched yesterday, Global Sustainability. So without doubt, everyone in this room, all the speakers gathered here, the geologists and Earth System scientists, uh, Wendy Brudgoit, um, Helmut Weissert, um, and the others I've mentioned um, are part of one of the most intellectually stimulating and profound debates in science right now. Whatever we all think about it, the reason it is receiving so much attention is because the Anthropocene matters, or does it? So before I introduce the first speaker, um, I want to do a quick survey. Could we put the, um, the slide up? So, uh, do a quick quiz with you all. Earl Ellis did this at um, AGU this year um, at the session on the Anthropocene. I thought I'd, uh, I'd do something again. So if we just have um, a round of hands, and if you want to tweet about it, um, EGU 16, Anthropocene, yes, no, never. So who thinks, who thinks in this room we, we are in the Anthropocene? I don't have anybody counting. That's, uh, so who says that there's not quite enough information to say whether we're, we're in the Anthropocene yet? We still need to do more work on it. One. Excellent. <laughs> and who says, can we ever say we're in the Anthropocene? We're just too close to it. We, we just can't say 
four people, I see four hands, five, six hands, seven hands, any hands over here? Okay, um, any, any other option that I haven't mentioned? Okay, so then the next quiz, and maybe this is for the people who asked, answered yes to the first one. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so, if we are in the Anthropocene, um, when did it begin? Um, who thinks uh, agricultural revolution? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, maybe about fifteen. Who thinks sixteen ten? The enigmatic sixteen ten Orbis spike. <laughs> <laughs> All will be clear later. <laughs> we have one for sixteen ten. Anyone else for sixteen ten? Okay. And uh, <laughs> good, good, good luck there. <laughs> uh, Eighteen hundred industrial revolution. Uh, quite a few for that. Nineteen uh, fifties great acceleration. Okay, I'd say the majority is the industrial revolution. Okay. Um, fantastic. So with that. Um, I'm going to introduce and invite up to speak our first speaker, Andy Revkin. Um, Andy Revkin has explored humanity's relationship with the environment for more than 30 years. His prize-winning books and magazine articles for two decades of writing for the New York Times, um, more recently for the, for the Dot Earth blog. Uh, and since 2010, he's taught courses in online communication at uh, Pace University in New York State. Uh, and he was on the inaugural engagement committee of Future Earth. And he's a member of the Anthropocene Working Group, who meet uh, later this week. So welcome, Andy. Yes, it's great to be here. Um, I, I am probably going to be a little bit fuzzy. Uh, I'm going slide free, which is always a danger. And I'm also a little bit sleep deprived, just came in this morning. Uh, you're probably wondering why is a journalist on the Anthropocene work, Working Group, um, but actually I want to start with one observation. It, on, on our side of the Atlantic, we tend, those who even know about this concept tend to say Anthropocene, and here people tend to say Anthropocene. So this is all so novel that we don't even know how to pronounce the term yet. It would be good to kind of settle that if it's going to become a formal construct for the rest of time. Uh, so maybe that's one thing I will work out in the Anthropocene Working Group. Um, the reason I'm on that group, I was kind of invited in a very, like in a kindly way. It, for those who are familiar with the history of this, um, um, it really devolves from observations made by Paul Crutzen and uh, Eugene Stormer, uh, 2000, 2002, that, that uh, from that, through that juncture, there was this more formal idea that we have entered a post-Holocene um, geological epoch or epoch um, of our own creation. And that leads to all kinds of interesting questions. Um, and what, what happened was people found out belatedly that in 1992, um, I had written this book. It's a very inconsequential book in many ways. It was my first book on global warming. It came out it was connected with the American Museum of Natural History exib exhibit that year, which was the first museum exhibition on global warming, which I had been writing about since 1988. And I had a line in here that sort of predicted what's played out, but I wasn't thinking things would be kind of in fast motion. I'm gonna just read you this passage from, it was a chapter where, you know, I'd been writing this chapter on uh, kind of like change, the pace of change uh, and, and what's going on. And so uh, I kind of vaguely remember when I was writing this, just, it was just sort of closing out a chapter. Let me get to the right spot. A scene of changes was the uh, name of the chapter. And I said, you know, human beings and the rest of the inhabitants of planet Earth may now have to brace for a new and much more drastic period of change. Perhaps two billion years ago, the fate of the planet was forever altered by living things as photosynthesis flooded the atmosphere with oxygen. That's that great oxygen event which was catastrophic for a lot of species um, that were anaerobic. Um, now a life form is influencing Earth's fate once again as the explosive expansion of human populations and industry dumps tens of billions of tons of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases into the air. Humans at least have proved able to adapt themselves to continual shifts in climate when they've been gradual. A little bit of a blah, 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 blah. So then perhaps Earth scientists of the future will name this new post-Holocene 
period, for its causative element, for us. We're entering an age that might someday be referred to as, say, the Anthracene. I was, you know, I didn't have Greek etymology, you know, Anthropo is the better way to build a, a new term, uh, Anthracene. At any rate, there it is. After all, it's a geological age of our own making. The challenge now is to find a way to act that will make geologists of the future look upon this age as a remarkable time, a time in which a species began to take into account the long-term impact of its actions. The alternative may be to leave a legacy of irresponsibility and neglect of the biosphere that could eventually manifest itself in the fossil record as just one more mass extinction like the record of bones and footprints left behind by the dinosaurs. So, um, and then this disappeared. Remember 1992, Pinatubo had erupted. Climate was kind of cooling for a little bit. We were in the Gulf War. Uh, uh, a lot of countries were distracted by that. The economy was kind of booming. Oil prices were really low. So climate change had been an issue when I first started writing about it in 1988, but it went away by that time. This book went out of print very quickly. You can get a copy on Amazon.com, used for like 99 cents plus shipping. So uh, <laughs> if you want your own, I get no revenue from the, that at all. Um, so, so uh, and then, you know, Will Stefan and, and, and Yen and everybody, uh, you know, kind of thought, well, that's interesting. But what's interesting to me is when I, I know that when I wrote that, when I was talking about geologists of the future, I wasn't thinking like eight years from then. <laughs> I was figuring generations, hence someone will make this determination. And that gives you a sense of this, the fast forward nature of so many things that are happening on planet Earth right now. And to me, um, it also gives us a sense of, when you look at the data, you look at, there was a recent paper by Peter Clark, uh, Ray Pierre Humbert, Humbert, Humbert and others on um, just, just looking at sea level, you know, right now, well, the, the Holocene sea level was basically da 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 and then they have, uh, this paper was, uh, the consequences of this century's climate policy decisions on a multi-millennial timescales. And you can just see these, the graphs for future sea levels are all up, 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 up. And we just, and it goes for one, the high one is 50 meters above today's sea level for 10,000 years and onward. Uh, the trajectory to that level is uncertain. And then it, there's modular, modulated ones for lower emissions trajectories, but there, you see such a profound change between the Holocene and now, it's really hard to say um, that, that it, there isn't an argument for a new geological period. The, the interesting questions, there, there are so many questions, and you heard Capitalazine, I, I, Carl Safina, a biologist friend of mine, a great writer, he calls it the obscene. <laughs> uh, you know, and this is where the value judgments come in, and, and they're, they're, but, but I think that the reality is that there is a, a, new, there is a new phase that, you, that will be in the rock. Um, and I'm the non-PhD on this working group. Um, we'll be in, in um, Oslo Friday and Saturday. Uh, there have been a bunch of papers being written. Uh, some are out, some are coming, that lay, out, lay it down kind of the basic um, uh, underpinnings of, of the idea that, that a new thing has happened. But I, I interviewed Yan uh, for Dot .Earth, my blog at the Times, I think it was late last year, did a Skype interview with him, where I asked him, to me there are some really big questions about this. One is, geology, at least as far as I've understood it, is, is implicitly retrospective, right? You know, rock is something that was formed in the past, except for volcanology, uh, which is there right in front of you. Um, and so here's an ep epoch where you've got your starting point, but you don't know how that's gonna play out. So how, does, how, do you, how do you name, how do you create, how do you formalize um, a geological period before it's happened? And he said, well, that's one of the many novelties that we face in this, in this period. So, so you know, I think it really is fundamentally new. And getting, and this idea of um, the anthropocentric questions is real. Um, I'll give you another example of one of the uncertainties. I can think of two ways this, this could play out where you have essentially a totally inconsequential human uh, layer in the rock. You'll have that layer of radioisotopes from the atomic tests and plastic, lots of plastic. As George Carlin uh, said, that was our destiny, just to make plastic, the comedian. Um, but so, but we, could have, we could have almost an imperceptible geological Anthropocene if we, if we basically go extinct or become society just completely goes away, or if we become really smart and 
learn how to live on a planet uh, with a limited footprint. That you could have a, a human Anthropocene, meaning uh, an, a long era of our existence on this planet, but without much of a trace in the rock that you could point to and say something big and bad happened there, um, or not. So, so that's, that's an interesting thing. Are we gonna flame out or can we have that long glow? Is it sort of like, to me, it's like the different, distant, difference between um, a burning match head. Um, so far, we seem very much like a match head. We just, the fuels are there, the potentiality is there, and we just go as a species. Um, and that, that means, but, but there is this prospect of a, a different kind of outcome. I just this morning was with Wolfgang Lutz, who's a demographer here at IASA, just outside of Vienna. And we were talking about their work on, they, they've done some 200 year plus sort of modeling of demographic trends that speak of an Anthropocene we, that doesn't have that OMG element to it. Where in the year 2300, there could be a billion people on the planet who are basically all kind of prosperous. There'll never be pure equity and you know, that kind of thing. But you could have an outcome like that without a calamity in the middle. Like there, there, there seem to be possibilities at least. You could draw curves for humanity that if you do certain things, if you get education for girls, if you get you know, everything that we all know that is in that bundle of things called sustainability or the sustainable development goals, you can have um, some outcomes that aren't, aren't horrific. Obviously, biologically, there's a lot going on that could be troubling. Um, we are extinguishing species all the time, but there could be a way forward. And this gets to the, the last um, uh, sort of judgment question, which has been out there lately. Uh, Clive Hamilton and I and uh, Betsy Colbert and others have been negotiating this question of a good Anthropocene, or at least a good path through this period. And uh, you know, some people, um, I think Betsy tweeted, uh, it seems inadvisable to put the words good and Anthropocene in the same sentence. That was one of her tweets. Um, but I don't think either he, she or Clive Hamilton are wishing for a bad Anthropocene. So the question is, how do you chart a creditable human path in this period? And this gets far from the sciences that are geophysical into the sciences that are psychological, social, political, and not just the sciences, but the values questions that attend what happens now. Uh, and I'm gonna end so we have enough time for questions, but one of the questions that I think uh, the science community has to put to itself is to make the value judgment about what you do with your skills. This is the future Earth question. The, this is the, uh, at the Vatican in 2014, I was at a big meeting on sustainable humanity, sustainable planet, our responsibility. That was the question on the floor. And there were scientists, economists, theologians, church figures, and a lot of the answers that came out of that meeting were not about data. So this, everyone has to examine, you know, what do you do, what do, you do with your time? What do you do with your skills? Uh, and one paper to look up, I urge anyone in the room, Dan Kamen at Berkeley and uh, Michael Dove at Yale wrote a, pay, the first iteration of this was almost 20 years ago. It was called uh, The Virtues of Mundane Science. You can Google for it, it's online in several different iterations. And this is about, you know, the, what is the responsibility of science to not just be the leading edge, cutting edge, new, new knowledge entity, but also to put some of its skills to work to get us through this transition to whatever comes next, to get us uh, some kind of a s smoother junk, uh, version of our curve of us going forward. So just ask, you know, it's worth asking that question. I, as a journalist, I ask that question all the time. You know, what do I write about? You know, I could write about music, too, which I really like. But I think we all have to find some part of us that we can devote to this, this question that's not just science defining the Anthropocene in a technical way, but science helping us navigate the Anthropocene going forward. So I'm going to leave it at that. Lots more to say. Uh, buy a copy of the book online. It's a lot of fun. And uh, let's hear some more discussion. Thank you. I'll stay here, because there's a lot more to say. But do you have some questions for me? Yeah. I want to add uh, maybe another idea. When entering the Anthropocene, and this idea is coming from a very good book by Stanislav Lem called Fiasco. Uh, he's, he's in a way saying, not, in the, not using the word Anthropocene, that it is a big for it. 
that you can, we have two options. One is to go to a technosphere where the biogeochemical, global biogeochemical cycles in the end are replaced by technology. And uh, the other one is uh, keeping our impact on a lower level and try to live under the natural biogeochemical cycle. And the more you go in one direction, the less it's possible to return to this deportation world. And uh, I think we are not, as a global community, we are not really aware that we are at this deportation world and we don't have a decision process. We have, in the moment, we have in Europe uh, leaders who want to build fences around their nations and in the US walls. Right. And, uh, uh, so, so we are, we don't have the political process. We are, it seems that we are trying to depend on national solutions, which is yeah. definitely wrong. Um, my question to you is, what do you think how this political process to, to raise this global awareness, to make this global decision at humanity, yeah. I, it's, it, did everyone hear that okay? It, it's, well, I'll try to articulate my response around that question. I, I got to read that book. St uh, Lamb? Yeah, it's uh, called Fiasco? Fiasco, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, this is the idea that we're at a juncture where um, I'll just, just I'll tell a little story about the Zoom nature of us and this expectation that we just have to keep on zooming more as the way forward, the way out. Not just about geoengineering, that's like, that's a caricature, but think about uh, in terms of uh, agricultural productivity, more and more and more, or whatever. Uh, I, was at, I was at the Santa Fe Institute maybe five years ago, and Jeff, Jeffrey West, who's a complexity physicist, theorist, um, gave this talk where he said, you know, he showed this graph that's essentially human history is a bunch of like cusps of, uh, a zoom and then a pause and then a zoom and then a pause. And he said, we just have to keep doing, we have to go further in that direction. He was, he, his um, talk was built around mega cities and, but had this presumption of needing to accelerate the zoom thing. And, and I've written a lot about the uh, disinvestment in basic energy, let's say energy science uh, and, and agricultural science that we're, we're neglecting to pursue the, these, what we need to do to get through this. But I always, I keep asking myself, this question of uh, does that just is that just building more vulnerability? Another guy to think of, who to look at uh, is Stefan Halgate. He's a Halgat. He's a, a World Bank economist who writes about um, how we always inadequately we do climate adaptation or any kind of adaptation. We do it to just the wrong point where we, we actually we think we've solved the problem, but we've actually built more vulnerability for the next bigger failure. And it reminds me on the flight here. I saw The Big Short. Has anyone seen the, the film yet? It's kind of very American film, but it's about the, the financial crisis and these guys who predicted it. And it, everything in that film was uh, an echo of this question that you just asked about. Um, you, you know, that film was about the status quo economists were, we just have to keep doing the same thing. Even the, these, these, ma these quants were going, wait a minute, this doesn't add up at all. And they were right. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a disturbing, undercurrent, I think, um, it, but it's, it's pre-political. It's like, it's about human nature to a certain extent. And, you know, politics is a reflection of how we think and how we behave and our short time scales. And so learning more about that is a vital part of the, getting through the Anthropocene as well. I can't tell you how bummed I am about how long it took me to start focusing my reporting on the behavioral and social sciences you know, I reported about global warming and all these issues for 20 years as a, just a sort of a geophysical, biological, technical thing. And then I got into the, the behavioral and social science and was like, oh shit, <laughs> excuse my French, you know. <laughs> and, and, and that's partially what got me out of journalism, full-time journalism. You know, I went to academia along with what I do writing-wise because I realized, you know, I, I was looking at all these studies that said more information doesn't matter. <laughs> like, oh no, should I just spend the rest of my life writing more stories that don't matter? So, I don't know the answer to the question, but it's a great one, an important okay, we'll one. Probably time for, uh, one or two Sorry, yeah. Can we wait for a microphone? Now do Simon and... Yeah, well, this, uh, sure. Him and then Simon. Okay. Or you could, well, they could just ask the two questions and then I could... Oh yeah, sure, take both at the same time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, in your last remark, your conclusion about uh, geosciences need to uh, focus how to navigate us out of the Anthropocene or into the Anthropocene. 
since this is a session on geoscience and the Anthropocene, you have some uh, recommendations how geoscientists should, should bring this message or should indeed not focus on their methodology or on their on their, just their fact-finding, but maybe have not something else in mind? Uh, yeah, and Simon, do you want to ask your question? Um, hi, so I thought your, the, this point about irreversibility and, and reversibility and whether we can have a sort of trajectory that has a, quote, good Anthropocene. Um, and it, but if you look at the big changes in Earth's history, then they're all about what happens to life. That's how we often break it up. And with the extinctions, agriculture, movement of species, and that ongoing evolutionary trajectory from those big, big switches of species across continents and across ocean basins, then we are going to have this permanent, irreversible shift to some other evolutionary trajectory than if we weren't here and hadn't had the last yeah. few hundred years. Um, so that's a kind of, it's a, it's a bit different from this good, bad Anthropocene, because we could still have a, quote, good Anthropocene, but still completely transform the planet. So maybe, uh, maybe it's more like hard, easy Anthropocene. I mean, to some extent, the only good, the good, bad stuff is all uh, a judgment call based on what we homo, sap homo sapiens think about what we need. You know, the loss of the Great Barrier Reef, corals as a group of organisms are gonna be around way longer than we are. But the coral reefs that we cherish uh, are the things that are vulnerable. So that's, uh, you know, implicitly, the good, bad stuff is all about nature as we care about it anyway. So maybe it's hard, easy. <laughs> In, in a sense, to just be selfish, I mean, to be sort of anthropocentric in a way. That, is that what we're more talking about? I mean, the planet's going to, as George Carlin said, if you haven't seen George Carlin's 1992 rant about uh, Earth's going to do just fine, it's people who are <laughs> effed, uh, you go on YouTube and watch it. Everything he said is a function of this question. Uh, so so I, I guess I think... Getting, getting comfortable with the anthropocentric aspects of those questions, I think, is, is a starting point. Um, and in terms of geosciences, uh, uh, I just spent time at the Earth Observatory in Singapore. Uh, I'm a, I just joined their science advisory board as kind of the generalist. And, uh, you know, it's a, basically they, they're a geohazards uh, think tank, a research center. And a lot of what they're doing is they're doing a lot of important fundamental work on volcanology and on earthquake science, but they're also very focused on the realities in, in, in that part of Asia right now. Uh, are, the vulnerabilities are just stunning and finding ways to, you know, any kind of predictability you can do on, on volcanic plumes, you know, as it relates to aviation, and as that relates to economics is really important too. So they're trying to sort of find, navigate that path toward useful knowledge along with frontier knowledge. And they've been doing both at the same time. So it's like a, finding a balance of, um, Learning to, you know, when, it, when Mayor Bloomberg in New York, is the, I wrote about this critically a couple of years ago. I mean, he's very much, when he left office, he was very, now he's at the UN, he's like a climate, one of the UN's climate ambassadors. But he gave this, his last speech in New York was a we will not retreat speech. So here's an urban, a coastal city mayor saying, our shorelines are our biggest asset, we will not retreat. And, you know, anyone, any earth scientist or anyone who's focused on sea level rise knows that that's fundamentally anti-scientific. It's actually denial. That's climate denial of a different kind. And, and, you know, pointing that out in a constructive way, saying we have to find a way to design cities uh, in an energetic, enthusiastic way with the idea that there's no new normal coastline anymore through the rest of human experience for at least 10,000 years. Whether it's a low trajectory or a high one, there's no new normal coastline. How do you do that? So that's kind of a, you know, there's an opportunity there. It's kind of engineering-ish. It's less science-ish. But at least pointing out those realities, I think, is an important starting point. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, sure. That was a fantastic opening and good scene setting. And it leads uh, perfectly on to the, the next talk. Um, by, uh, so I'd like to invite Libby Robbins up. Uh, Libby is professor um, at the Fenner School of Environment and Society and guest professor at KTH, uh, the, um, at, uh, 
uh, in Stockholm. Uh, she's an environmental historian, um, uh, working in environmental history, museum studies, history of biodiversity, biological conservation, ecological humanities, and the history of science. Uh, and we'll speak about how do people live in the Anthropocene. Thank you, Libby. Thanks very much, Owen. Um, just to be really confusing, my name's Libby Robin. I've written about birds, but it's not Robin. <laughs> um, well, how do people live in the Anthropocene? This is a humanities sort of question. So we're not... We, I guess we're picking up where Andy just left off about navigating the, the Anthropocene. But, but I think the way we do it is we're looking at effects, not causes. And a lot of the discussion about the Anthropocene has been about when did it begin and where is it going, rather than how do we live with it. So that would be the slight difference in my approach. Yes, it does work. Is that not clear? Oh. <laughs> so can, it, can everybody hear me? Oh, whoops. Um, that's interesting. Um, and can people follow my accent? I appreciate an Australian accent is a little unusual. Um, I want to talk about Anthropocene and Anthropocene, capital and lowercase. I'm not going to talk about Anthropocene and Anthropocene. It's quite simple. If you say kilometre, you say Anthropocene. If you say kilometre, you say Anthropocene. End of story. Nothing very interesting in that. But um, I, I think the idea of... of um, I do need to walk. I feel stuck behind there. It's much better. So we have a, a sensu stricto. This is what the stratigraphers and the golden spike are all about. And we have a sensu lato, and this is what the artists are doing. This is a, a wonderful um, painting of the blowing up of the Didcot uh, nuclear or coal-fired power station uh, towers in... Uh, in Britain last year, and it's got an, a video on top. So Alexander Boynes did the video, and Mandy Martin, who happens to be his mother, did the artwork underneath. It's an amazing combination. So we're having all sorts of Anthropocenes, and I wanted to sort of look at the trajectory, and I'm putting the Anthropocene Working Group and the Great Acceleration somewhere in the middle there, since we've already heard about them. So. If we start with the chronostratigraphic chart, where the question is, have we left the Holocene? That's, I guess, the, the question. Um, I'm a little concerned, just Andy's comment about not having future before. We, the Holocene didn't have an end before, so we've, we've, we've had futures before. That's not a problem. Now, this is the a group in Stockholm. Um, Jön, Jan Rockström and others from the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And they've developed this pie chart on planetary boundaries, which has been regarded by some museums as quite iconic. When you see um, Anthropocene or climate change in museums, you often see this chart. It's, a, it's got a, a, a big um, image for how many planets are we using up for all these amazing... Um, Factors: the biosphere integrity, climate change, land change systems, freshwater use. But they're all things that we can measure, that are global, and they focus on the operating space of humanity rather than on people as agents or holders of moral responsibility. So the question for them is... Um, Uh, sorry, I've, 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 this uh, business of operating spaces. Sorry, I've just uh, I've tried to put in some bits from Andy's talk that I've been too clever. Now this one's me. This is the the uh, humanities. So we have in the humanities some people who are optimistic, but there's a lot of pessimism too. And I think a lot of it's about legacy anxiety. And this is a lovely piece that Robert McFarlane put in the uh, Guardian very recently. He's a professor of English literature at Cambridge. And he said, what will survive of us is love, wrote Philip Larkin. Wrong. What will survive of us is plastic. And lead 207, the stable isotope at the end of the uranium-235 de decay chain. It's uh, the, the, a lot of the stuff in the humanities is uh, about anxiety.
Sorry, the mouse isn't working. Yep, that's better if you just... I, I just tend to go forward, that's easy. Um. So what we're all working to do is to produce scholarship for weird futures. It's not all in English. Uh, this one in the middle here is, um, if you're guessing, it's, it's Estonian. But you can still see the foot and the earth underneath it and get the idea. It's actually a social change uh, magazine. Overland is a literary magazine from Australia. And we have Smithsonian Magazine's uh, conference and the, one of the four new Anthropocene journals, as well as the website dedicated to that. Next slide, please. I think we're seeing a little anxiety from within the International Commission on Stratigraphy. This, this paper came out this month in GSA Today. Is the Anthropocene Commission on Stratigraphy being asked to make what is in effect a political statement? Now this is something, uh, Stanley Finney is the current, you probably all know this, but he's the current chair. He's soon to, uh, I think he's soon to, to not be the chair, but he is currently the chair. I'd like to um, say that I think that this paper is about defending the ICS knowledge system against alternative scholarly methods and against integrative methods across disciplines. It's about what's permissible expertise for making this decision, which is, of course, political anyway. So expertise is political. It, you can't get away from that. I'm really happy to discuss that one further in the, uh, in the uh, Q&A, because I'd love to hear report from, from your views on this. It's, a, it's an amazing paper to have come out just, just in time for this panel. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm a historian, so that I should explain. I come from the history of science. I'm interested in the history of scientific controversies. And this one seems to me to be perfect. This was a, a forum that was published in the Australian Historical Studies, which is probably a journal none of you have seen, but it was on the Anthropocene in 2013. Um, next slide, please. So how did I get into this? How did I find this? Well, I, I first heard about the Great Acceleration and in connection with a, a project called the Integrated History and Future of People on Earth. Modest project, I hope. Um, and I heard about it in 2005 when Will Steffen came to Australia to be my boss. And I said to him, so what, what historians do you have involved with your I hope project? And he looked at me as if I was some sort of quaint species he'd never seen and said, historians? I hadn't thought of historians. That's a good idea. Anyway, very quickly, John McNeil was involved. And it was, in fact, John McNeil who came up with the idea of the great acceleration. The people who were sitting around the room talking about big accelerations in all their data didn't know that around about the time all those things, all those hockey stick curves go up, um, Carl Pogliani wrote The Great Transformation. So The Great Acceleration is a reference to a book that came out in 1944, perfect timing, and just gives it a bit more dignity. So The Great Acceleration, with all the little graphs uh, up in the top, which I, I'm not going to attempt to explain, actually is something that, um, that historians are interested in too. And I'm interested in why scientists wanted to write history in connection with the Anthropocene and in connection with the, uh, the late 1940s, there was another project to write a history of humanity. That's the paper at the bottom. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Perfect. So my current project, working with uh, Sverker Serlin uh, in Stockholm and Paul Ward at Cambridge, um, we've, we have one book already called The Future of Nature, Documents of Global Change, which is an anthology of documents. And when a Swede, an Australian and an Irishman go into a pub, they come up with ideas for not one but two books. And we're, we're in, nearly finished a book called The Environment, A History. So that's what we're working on at the moment. But we're really interested in historicising the idea of expertise. Next slide. So the same experts haven't always been the experts for the future. In the 15th century, it was the prophet. You'd go to the prophet to find out what was going to happen next. Hotline to God. Later, you would get novelists, and some of you will be familiar with Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's book, that's the 1880s. 
1950, C.P. Snow said, the scientists have the future in their bones. So I've picked a 1950s scientist there with a pipe. We start getting future studies as a specialty in association with the Stockholm Conference in 1972 and the foundation of the United Nations Environment Pro Program. And then we have big science. We have the greenhouse summer of 1988 with the young James Hansen telling the US Congress that something's changing. So this, just to give you an idea of different sorts of experts. And the idea that it's, it's not the same experts in every era. I think that's probably very important. Next slide. So we, we have different origin stories for the Anthropocene, and they depend on your expertise. Paul Crutzen chose the Industrial Revolution because he was looking at carbon in the sky. William Ruderman chose the Agricultural Revolution because he was interested in agriculture. And the nuclear signals from the atomic age come from a, a range of different places, but at the right time to coincide with what the Great Acceleration is telling us. So that's more a collection of different scientists who've come together with that one. Next slide. So when did the Anthropocene begin is one question, but what sort of futures are possible is another. And the Pleistocene rewilding project is another, one, another future that's coming out of Anthropocene discussions. Next slide. Just so that you get a sense, you don't have to read this slide, this is not one to read. These are some of the Anthropocene events, mostly in English, because they're mostly ones I've had something to do with, uh, that have happened in, since 2000, May 2011 when the um, Geological Society UK had the Anthropocene, a new epoch of geological time as a conference. At about the same time, we had violent ends, arts of environmental anxiety at the National Museum of Australia. That was something I ran. And we've got a huge number of things since. A lot of them are by artists, museums, and humanities scholars, not by ICS people. And I think I put the last one down because you can't even Google this one. The Association for Literature of the Environment it has a postgraduate event called A Change of Scene, reviewing our place in a new geological epoch. I think it's here when people don't even have to say Anthropocene. They've, they're leaving it out. Next slide. So what do we do when we do Anthropocene in museums? It's obviously not something very simple to do. One of the things that we've been having is Anthropocene slams. There was one just before the conference in um, Berlin that um, Owen mentioned. And we bring along an object that speaks to the Anthropocene. And it's like a poetry slam. You have to actually perform it. So you've got three minutes and it's fast and it's happening. The only difference between a poetry slam and an Anthropocene slam is it's collaborative, it's not competitive. So we have to try together to build lots of different ideas using different objects. And in this case, Mandy Martin, the artist, ran one in association with an art event. So actually artists made the objects. This one is um, the Cape Farewell Project, where they projected discounting the future onto an iceberg. As, and this is, the, uh, what, this is the group in Melbourne, Climb Art, Arts for a Safe Climate. Thanks, next slide. And the Welcome to the Anthropocene exhibit at the Deutsches Museum in Munich has been a major collaboration between scientists and um, historians at the Rachel Carson Centre. And Nina Muller's here, who is the senior curator, is talking to John McNeil, actually. But she, uh, she said at this conference in Seattle uh, two weeks ago, she said, it's interesting the way artists are actually becoming scientists through this exhibition. So um, I'll, I'll leave that out there for, for the discussion, but we'll move on. Yep. Um, we have a museums and climate change network, and that's a shameless plug for a book coming out later this year, Curating the Future. And it's interesting, Andy, you said you, your work was picked up by the American Museum of Natural History. They're the ones who have hosted this event. But we actually have um, Ben Scherer at the back there from, um, from HKW in Berlin, Harkave in Berlin. 
and some of the other people from the Deutsches Museum and people from Australia. The focus of this was actually the Pacific. We were starting with the people for whom climate change was happening first. So we had the, the uh, ambassador from Samoa at the, at, the, uh, at the conference. I'll speak more about any of these. Yeah, next one. There's a whole host of things happening in the environmental humanities, including one today, the Gothenburg University Environmental Humanities Network is being launched as I speak. Um, these are people who are thinking about how people need to respond, not denying or saying it's happening, but saying something's happening, and this is a good metaphor for talking about rapid change in our time. It's about the dynamic change and how that affects people. And so, just, just uh, again, don't, don't worry about the detail, but there are lots happening. Um, next. So, I just want to finish up with the thought that it takes more than two cultures to see the Anthropocene. And this wonderful sculpture is underwater, so it will change with time as the fish and coral change. Jason DeCare's tailor is a, um, the artist, and it's called The Banker, and he has his head in the sand. <laughs> I think as well as taking more than, more than two cultures, it might also take uh, bottom-up as well as top-down. So we need to get away from fixing the Anthropocene and turn it into asking questions that can invite small solutions from below, that people have a hope of answering. If there's no hope of doing anything, people will do nothing. We know that for sure. So we, what we need is to break the questions down into the size of questions that people might actually be able to find solutions for. Last slide. And I'm going to finish with where we began with the Anthropocene, with Paul Crutzen. And his advice, there are many things that make me feel positive. Most of all, through the creative strength that can be found in art and literature, we can understand the world better. Getting beyond one's own expertise, he was, he's an atmospheric chemist, but he recognises that art and literature may be other ways to do this. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Libby. So, um, any, any questions arising from Libby's um, provoking talk? One. Yeah, we have uh, one at the back. If you, I think there's a microphone uh, there's just a in the centre there. Thank you very much for making nice easy point that the Anthropocene is out of the hand of the geologist and earth scientist and so on to many rains. So, uh, but what is now your answer to the question which in the end we have to tackle how to bring the natural science side and the non-natural science side together. Showing that there is thinking in many areas happening, this is the the soil out of which we have to grow. But what, what, what we have to do next in order to put it in my words, to give the humans as an engineering species the ability to shape the future that is, is a nice one for us. Thank you very much. Well, I think probably I'm, I'm breaking away from the idea of the humanity as a species. I think that that is one of the big divides between the way I talk about things and the way you talk about things. And I'm trying to get away from the idea that, that we are all in this in the same way. We're not. We are, are actually a very small subset of the people in this world who've, who've created the changes. So the people who've benefited from the fossil fuels are not the majority of the people in the world. But the people who are, are on the receiving end will be disproportionately those who haven't actually been part of the engineering revolution, as it were. So we have to listen to the ways they want to do things as well as the ways we might help. Clearly, there are 
really obvious things we can do in first world countries that will make things go faster or slower into the future. But if we keep following that trajectory, it's, it's a pretty miserable line. I mean, we have a, in Australia, we have a hug a climate scientist day every year because their narrative is, is, is not very cheerful and they need a big hug. Uh, the government's not helping by sacking them either at the moment, but um, so that there is, uh, there is actually, it is very hard if, you're, if your narrative is entirely negative, how you can do things. But you can move people's hearts and hands to work to support their minds. So that if, if it becomes a, an engineering problem and it's your hands, maybe that's different from if it's your science. And if it's your heart, it's different again. And we've got to try all those things, not just one of them. I mean, we, have, we must make sure we don't privilege one over another and we're very conscious of which experts we're privileging as we speak. Okay, and uh, there's a question over here. Um, if you could... If you speak up, I can repeat it. But we're on live stream as well, so oh. this is all being live streamed, so it would be good to have the questions. Uh, do you want to use this why microphone? Why don't you get him? You come down the front. <laughs> then you'll be on the screen. <laughs> it won't be just me. That's a good idea. Well, I have a question concerning the nature-culture dichotomy. You were using those terms here. And one way to put the Anthropocene is that this aspect or the idea of uh, the world becoming self-referential is a main issue here. And the ways we uh, divide our knowledge up and our expertise, you were referring to these, how different the experts were over time. And now if you look at the ways we uh, are systematic about our expertise in the two cultures between humanities and natural sciences, is that really up to the problem? And if you would like to change it, what would you think would be the most critical interface to work on? Because simply the way our science is geared up may, no, may not be matching the problem anymore. I, I, th I think I agree with the comment um, uh, without really being able to say terribly much, except that I think that we do need to become more familiar with each other's language. Uh, and among my colleagues, people are quite scared of very technical sounding documents, and that puts people off. And they. They really get it when someone performs it. I mean, at the um, conference we had in, uh, which was about climate change rather than the Anthropocene, but at the conference we had at the American Museum of Natural History, we had a, a young theatre performer lying on his kennel, dressed up as Snoopy the dog, and the sea rose around him and he was talking. And people, people could see that the kennel was clearly in trouble in a very upfront way. So I think using, using everything, talking, drawing, performing, having objects, different things will switch different people on. And, and we need technical language and we need the information that the geosciences offer as well. I mean, it's, it's just, we can't say that we, know, we need to know more and more and more of the same what we need is a way of integrating the sort of ways of knowing more than the information, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, any, any questions? Any other questions? Um, if I may, um, I have, uh, we have time for, um, for one more question, which I, I would like to ask. I mean, you raised a very interesting... Um, well, there's an interesting slide on um, Stanley Finney's recent article, yeah. um, and you described it. it is, it's about defending the Commission's knowledge system. Um, would you like to, to explore that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it's slide seven, if you want to go back to it. So what they argue is... Um, of the, it, they, they ask this question, is the Commission being asked to make a political statement? Now, I think that's probably a very good example of the question you, you, you gave, where... It's either science or it's politics. Well, that's not the case anymore. And there's 50 years of science and technology studies out there to argue against that. So that was certainly uh, the idea that the um, earlier epochs were, were uh, natural and not political is a bit puzzling. The first one was the Carboniferous 
Surely there was a reason people were looking at the slice of rocks that had coal in them. That's surely political, certainly economic. Um, the history of stratigraphy is not by any means um, straightforward natural science. I mean, the, originally they were looking at unit st uh, strata types, which was something approved in Bologna, and then later they changed to a global standard strata type section and point. Now, you'll have to bear with me because this is not my language. I'm speaking a foreign language. But in 1972, there was a decision that what they did in, 19, in 1881 was not what they wanted to do now. So they made a shift according to their knowledge of the time. The context matters. And the context matters in science, it, it matters in society, it matters every time. So I just don't think that, that if they, that what's being asked is to do something different from what's happened before, so what? It's happened before. Thanks, thanks, Libby. Um, and which is a very provocative answer. Would anybody like to uh, have any comments on that? Oh, yeah. Any responses? Uh, I'll make a response to some. I'm not a stratigrapher. I do very different things, but I'm an earth scientist. And, I, and sorry, I don't agree with you at all. You know, the Carboniferous was based on the definition of the Carboniferous was based on fossils, on lithologies on the record as seen in the rocks, and whether it contained coal or not is, total, is beside the point. But it was the first one named. And when Captain Cook came to Australia, to take a random example, he was looking at what, where there were lines in the rocks that were black and may be coal-bearing. That was one of the things that he actually records in his journal. Yes. So his, the reason for looking at, at rocks in strange places was to find resources. Sure, but I don't think uh, Captain Cook, with all due respect, was a stratigrapher. Neither do I, but I think that he was speaking to a particular empire, and that particular empire... Uh, stratigraphy emerged later as a science, but the, the idea of looking at rocks for, for stripes was there to build on. Okay, Libby, thanks very much. Um, I'd li like to invite up our final speaker um, for this session before we go to a break, and that is uh, Gaia Vinst. Gaia Vinst is a, a journalist. Um, she writes for uh, and presented for, for the BBC and for The Guardian. Uh, she's been um, an editor, a news editor at Nature, um, an edit and features editor at New Scientist, and, uh, and sort of writer for Nature Climate Change. Last year, she published um, Adventures in the Anthropocene, uh, this, this book here, um, and, it's, um, and it won the, the Royal Society uh, Winton Award for Best um, Science Book of the Year. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's an incredible achievement, and it uh, really, I, I think a lot of the book focuses on marginalised people and, uh, and, and what the Anthropocene means there, and, uh, and Gaia is going to um, explore some of these ideas now, so, so please, Gaia. Um, yeah, probably. Um, I'll try. I'll try, and um, actually, I might. I might use the same device with a clicking because <laughs> I'm not very good. So um, I'm also um, uh, not um, an academic scientist, um, and I'm also Australian um, <laughs> and British. So I'm both. Um, so yeah, as, as Owen said, I, I was working at a desk job in London um, at the journal Nature. And across my desk was coming increasing evidence of a big change that, that was taking place. I was getting papers about um, moving river, rivers being dammed and rerouted, about extinctions, about um, changes to the chemistry of the oceans, temperature of the atmosphere, all sorts of things. And, and the one constant theme in all of this was us, was humans. And so... Um, I thought this was very interesting, and um, so I set off to explore the world at this extraordinary time that we're living, which, which I would say we are, we are entering the Anthropocene, I don't know how long it will last, but people already um, 
are facing the consequences of this. And I was interested to find out what happens when people live at the forefront and what it means for us. And I mean, our civilization, our culture, humanity, this big sort of super organism we're creating, um, it's, it's really evolved during the Holocene. This, our culture as, as human, as our specifically uh, human way of life as opposed to all the other primates as, a, as opposed to our human ancestors and cousins. Um, and so what does it mean for us now moving into um, a, a time of uh, unstable climate, which is unpredictable, um, where, where the world is getting warmer, of um, an increasingly large human population and of limited resources? Because the world that we have created, we've created very much um, in a time of stable, reliable climate where we can predict more or less when the monsoon is going to come, when um, human population is pretty low and when resources are plentiful. So lots of questions. Um, and and uh, how are we going to meet the crises that we're facing as a species, crises in um, how we're going to feed ourselves, how we're going to provide enough water, where our resources are going to come from, where we're going to live, what is our relationship to nature? All these huge questions, I think, are raised um, for scientists, for artists, but um, for us as humans uh, living together. So, um, yeah, um, I'll just take you quickly um, through some of these. Um, so, so when we look at how are we going to feed ourselves as a species, this is the Hadza um, people who, who uh, live very much as we lived before, the, um, before our invention of agriculture. It's a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, they have a very varied diet. Hunter-gatherers have a very varied diet. They um, eat, eat lots of different vegetables, lots of different fruits, honey, meats, all sorts of things. Um, when you think about their resources that they use, they're dressed in... He's got baboon fur for his headdress. He's wearing um, animal skins. They have some trade, limited trade, with um, neighbouring tribes for things like metals, for steel. Um, could we all go back to nature and live in this very sustainable way? Well, it's sustainable for the environment, but when we think about what sustainability means, we need to look beyond the environment. Is it sustainable for our species, for a, a large population? And no, of course it's not. Um, these people are facing an extinction of sorts themselves, this, this way of life, the hunter-gatherer way of life is um, for all hunter-gatherers, whether they're Inuit in the Arctic or whether they're Hadza in the tropics, um, are uh, facing an extinction, which is, to me, very sad because I come to all these questions from a very human perspective. What does it mean for us? Um, and the great diversity that we have of human cultures um, is what makes life very exciting for me. So. Um, they are being, uh, this, this way of life only works if you can roam across a large area in small bands of people. Um, agricultural people, so, so um, farming is pushing them into a smaller <coughs> unit. Also our decision to conserve animals and places. We've decided that people shouldn't be in, say, the Serengeti, or, um, uh, and they're, they're not allowed to hunt lions and whatever they want anymore. That's reserved for, um, you know, American dentists. So, um, this is not a sustainable way of life. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, yeah, this, so, so we, there we are. Delicious squirrel, not really enough to feed a lot of people. Um, um, yeah, carry on. <laughs> I'm being very slow. This is the neighbouring tribe. As you can see, this is the Datonga people. You see they're already living in houses. This is the next stage on our, on our journey as humans to feed ourselves, um, agriculture here. Um, when you live in a settled environment, you can live... Um, more people can live together. Um, communities can form, civilization. Um, sharing of ideas, etc., etc. But of course, diet is very limited. Um, it means you can store things like grains, you can make bread, you can do brewing, you make alcohol, that sort of thing. But but your diet is limited. You're limited to a few grains. And across the world, we're now our crops are, you know, a dozen or so that we depend on largely across the world. Um, and if you think about the huge variety. Um, of biodiversity that exists in, in um, just in cereals, that's that's quite surprising. And 
It's reducing our ability to, um, to meet our needs in the Anthropocene. We all know what, what happens when you rely on a very um, small number of, uh, number of crops. You, you, know, you, you risk all sorts of you know, um, pests, disease, um, and, and, and malnutrition from other um, ways. Um, so, so how are we going to feed ourselves in the, in, in the upcoming, in the next few decades? And really, questions like this, questions about, questions about the trajectory of the Anthropocene, really, to me, how the poor get rich is entirely going to shape the decades to come. And these are the, these are the, the questions that we really need to look at. And this is... This is the reality of how a lot of people, this is Uganda, of how a lot of people are doing agriculture at the moment. So we have malnutrition, we have, we have big problems. We need to, if we're going to have a population of say 9 or 10 billion by the end of the century, we need to um, double food production. We need to produce more food than we have done for the last 10,000 years. I mean, this is at a time when we have variable climate, where most of the best lands have already been taken um, for growing our food. 40% of the world's ice-free land surface is used to make our food. So what are we going to do? Are we going to knock down more rainforests? Are we going to, you know, what, what, how are we going to do this? Well, you know, there are a lot of actual hidden positives um, in this story. Like, like this, I mean, we're not, we're not doing agriculture to the best of our ability. Well, we have this form of agriculture, and then we have incredibly intensive forms of agriculture in, say, the American Midwest, <laughs> where the soils are completely ruined for another reason, because, uh, because of how they've been treated. So, so while our soils are being depleted, while water is becoming um, scarcer, while land is limited, we have to look at the way we produce enough food for enough people. And we're not just looking at um, starvation, at producing enough calories for people. We need to look at malnutrition. We need to look at making sure that everybody has enough protein and enough micronutrients for, say, brain growth in the first, you know, prenatally and in the first few years of life. Because a society where you're not reaching your full brain potential is, is not the best human society, I'd suggest. So... Um, so we can improve, this is, this is an example of how we can improve um, agriculture. This is, this is just um, a quick sample of some sweet corn maize um, varieties in, in Bolivia. We can use the varieties that we already have. We can um, use either genetically modify crops so that they contain more, um, more um, nutrients. We can um, breed different varieties. People are keeping stuff in, um, collecting seeds in seed banks. We can grow climate, um, climate appropriate crops, soil appropriate crops for places that are semi-arid, um, that have a lot of saline in the um, water supply. And we can look at things like how, how, how much of the food is wasted. So some 40%, between a third and 40% of all food in the developing world is wasted between the field and getting to somebody's table because it can't get to market because of terrible roads, because of um, uh, a variety of different issues which can be fixed. And at the same time, in the rich world, we're wasting between a third and 40% of our food aftermarket, so um, it's going into supermarket shelves and being thrown away, being spoiled, we're buying too much and leaving it to rot, throwing it away. So, so actually these are very positive stories. We can, we can achieve um, uh, producing enough food to feed 10 billion people through uh, addressing some of these very basic problems. But of course a basic problem is deceptively basic. There are... Um, we know the science, we need to look at the societal role. Um, I'll just skip through. So, one of the problems... Oh, have I? Yeah. One, one of the problems, of course, is the, um, is, is the issue that our planet is changing. We've got rising sea levels, we've got unstable climate, we've got um, 
problems with soils. So around the world, people are looking at alternatives. And that was, that was something that I really sought out. Um, on a, I, I took a two-and-a-half-year journey around um, mainly the global south, looking at how people are trying to address some of these issues. And, and this is an experimental floating garden. In, um, it's in a research centre in, um, uh, in um, Bangladesh. But, but actually, across Bangladesh, people are growing crops on uh, floating gardens where they can also do shrimp farming or um, fish farming. Um, it means the precious little bit of land that they have that is not flooded can be used for something else, perhaps putting housing on or roads. Um, the roads are absolutely appalling in Bangladesh and they're on these tiny little streets. So, um, so these are some of the solutions that people themselves have come up with. Um, this is a, a geneticist in um, Uganda who is looking at this idea of um, adding nutrients to, um, in this case, groundnuts, peanuts. And that's, that's, um, th this, is, this is a good idea for, for several reasons. Firstly, um, peanuts are not actually nuts, they're legumes, which, um, which means that they're one of the very few plants that is able to sort of self-fertilize because they have bacteria living in their root system, in their roots, which... Um, can um, take nitrogen and fix it and put it into the plant. And every bit of protein, all our DNA, everything that contains nitrogen, we've got ultimately from plants. And uh, the reason we all used to starve um, centuries ago, uh, not, not that long ago, is, is because of uh, lack of fertilizer. In fact, entire wars were fought in, the, um, in um, South America over bird poo. Bird poo, because it contains... Um, it's a natural fertilizer. And then, as we know, um, last century, uh, some German chemists came up with a solution for that, and we have artificial fertilizers, which has saved um, millions, if not billions, from starvation. Well, so um, that's one of the reasons why groundnuts are excellent. Also, they're perfectly suited to semi arid conditions. So, growing. Um, a growing appropriate crops is a really, really important way of uh, meeting our needs in the Anthropocene. And what, what we're doing a lot across the world is growing Holocene-appropriate crops, not Anthropocene-appropriate crops. Um, and what I mean by that is um, people are growing um, cash crops like cotton, and then uh, they haven't got enough food to feed their kids because cotton is very thirsty, and it's... A, um, it's not an appropriate crop. Okay, so he's, he's looking at genetically engineering peanuts, which are very oily, to contain vitamin A. And lack of vitamin A is a leading cause of blindness in the developing world. So um, um, you may have heard of golden rice. Well, this is golden peanuts, and it's much better than golden rice because peanuts are oily, and oily things dissolve vitamin A much better. So um, anyway, these are some of the solutions that um, I've seen across the world. Um, yeah, protein, a big problem. At the moment, we're getting it um, in um, a, a way that is crazy for the Anthropocene. We're getting it from cows, um, pigs, etc. Much better to get it from insects. Insects are delicious. They're already eaten around the world. Um, it's also it's environmentally sustainable, but um, as I was saying before, it's got to be human sustainable too. And, and, and um, so insects can be grown by women in small communities um, as a sort of a cottage industry, as a, as a side thing. All you need is a strip light, a gully to uh, drown the insects. You can do it. You can have your own income, which as a woman in a village is, um, can be really important socially um, in terms of your freedom, in terms of your children's potential, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, these are, these are some of the um, options. Um, for me, I think probably the biggest crisis that we're facing in terms of resources is, um, is, our, is our water situation. And all these can change. You know, at the moment, you know, most of the rain falls on the oceans. It's salty. We're using up um, the natural water, the great natural water storage that we had um, in the Holocene, the glaciers that store water for free, that are the... Um, are the source of some of the biggest rivers on the planet, um, reservoirs, rivers are being misused, polluted, diverted, dammed, etc., etc. Um, this is this is um, this is in the Tar Desert on the border of India and Pakistan, where they're rediscovering um, the ancient step wells. Um, they're they're cleaning them out and reusing them, and it's actually a very efficient way of storing water. Um, so so looking to the past um, to find clues of of uh, how to 
how to survive in the future. But when I say water is a really big issue, it's a really big issue not because we haven't got water, because we have. We've got lots of water. The oceans are there. We can do desalination, and desalination plants are being built everywhere. But at the moment, it's costly. Um, it's, it costs a lot um, of energy to produce that. Um, and also, what do you do with the salt? But this could change. You know, what if we had free energy? What if, um, what if a fusion, um, the great hope fusion power suddenly uh, worked? Energy would be free. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's... It, it, my entire life, it's been worrying about energy bills, worrying about, you know, wasting energy, etc. If energy was free, if um, solar became even cheaper and, and properly networked and gridded to us, um, that changes the dynamic. Then getting desal water, of course, it's not going to be as free as when we had um, glaciers and so on, but it's, it, it totally changes that problem. Um, anyway, sorry, carry on. Um, yeah, so, so we need to replace the, um, with more people and people living in inappropriate areas in big numbers um, as semi-arid conditions continue to expand and we have deserts in cities and um, slum dwellers living in deserts and so on. We need to bring water to people. So this is a, this is a canal system and canals are being built but not in nearly a big enough number. You know, our, our water, our hydro engineering is... Is, is minuscule compared to the problem that we are facing as um, a globally urbanizing, migrating community of, of humans who all need water to drink for agriculture, etc. So, um, this is water's a big problem, and it's something, something I um, focused on um, um, quite a bit on my journey. This is, um, this is Ladakh in the, in the Himalayas, which is um, a high altitude desert. Um, it, it, it really never rains here. It's on the border of India, Pakistan and, and China, a sort of contested region full of these really incredible um, uh, Buddhist people that speak Ladakhi. They have um, an ancient and beautiful, beautiful culture. Um, but they, they are migrating, and this is to, to the villages because they're not uh, they can't make their agriculture work because it relies entirely on uh, glacial meltwater. And when the glaciers disappear, they have no water. Um, so, uh, so someone's come up with a solution to this, a, a, a retired railway worker, Indian railway worker, who has um, pretty much by hand and with the help of villagers built artificial glaciers, which sounds impossible. And if you were to, if you were to plan this, you know, sitting in a, at a desk somewhere, you would think, this is impossible, I won't even try it. But when you, when you live in this situation and you are pushed to try it, some people will try alternative solutions. And so he creates a depression in the shadow of a mountain um, where the sun doesn't rise high enough to, um, in the winter months to, to hit this um, particular area. So any meltwater from glaciers higher up still, and, and to consider this is already uh, four and a half thousand meters, you know, this is, for me, completely out of breath, head spinny territory. Um, but, you know, I, I climbed up there and I wasn't sick. Hooray. Um, he's managed to do all this work under that. Um, and, and um, yeah, so he, he's, he, did, he makes um, little culverts and little um, uh, water channels to divert the water into his, into his um, place. And this is, this is the glacier that forms. And it's, it's brilliant because when the sun gets high enough above the mountain to actually hit the glacier, it melts at exactly the right time for uh, the seeds to be sown further down the valley. And um, this is the harvest that results. And, and actually, because... Because these people are also living at a time of global warming, they are benefiting not just from um, the new irrigation system. Instead of just being able to produce one crop... OK, I'll, I'll finish. But instead of just being able to produce one, one crop a year, they can now produce several, three crops, uh, three... Um, three harvests and different crops, so um, everything from apricots to um, tomatoes to fruits and so on. So, yeah, let's, I'll, just, I'll just show you um, a couple of other... That's the farmer. This is the, the amazing guy that did it. Okay, this is in the Peruvian Andes where people are trying another technique to bring back the glaciers of literally painting the mountain white, um, which... 
you know, less successful. Um, th this is what they've painted, and this is what they've got to paint. And and I'll just I'll finish with this one because um, this is a this is a brilliant technique. This is um, fog harvesting, which you may have heard of. And if you if you've not actually seen one of these fog harvesters, I, I'd just like to say that. They are absolutely incredible. If you stand there, there's, it never rains, never rains here. This is Lima in Peru, and it's a, it's a slum on the outskirts of Peru. Um, and it never rains here at all, but the air is thick with this, um, this fog. And if you stand next to this, you can hear the gushing of water running down this fog nest that's trapped in the fog net and, and rushes into the gutter. And it's, it's incredible. It's really incredible. So something so simple um, can produce so much water. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that people around the world are already dealing with the consequences of the Anthropocene. That we're either going to have to um, restore Holocene conditions in some places, and that may take um, geoengineering solutions like the artificial glacier or, or much bigger solutions like geoengineering um, the climate. Um, generally, or we're going to have to learn to live with the new Anthropocene conditions, um, um, or, or we're going <laughs> to be in trouble. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there because I've run out of time. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Gaia. Um, have we any, any questions on, on Gaia's talk? Uh, well, I certainly, uh, yeah, we have. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting to see. Uh, you you, you uh, showed that people already are capable of dealing with the Anthropocene. Is that what your end statement was? How do you think that geoscientists may have, have they an ability to help those people again with their techniques, with their knowledge of the Anthropocene? Well, there, so, so I, think it's, I think it's almost a two-way process. I think it's worth... Um, uh, so these people are not waiting for um, scientists, obviously, at Max Planck Institute or Oxford or Yale or wherever, to come up with a solution for them because they're living there and they are seeing the solution right on the ground. But at the same time, so, so I think it's worth the scientists actually going out and seeing what people are already doing. Um, but at the same time, they can almost act as conduits because they can, they can look at examples from around the world and see where, where one thing might work and another thing might not. Because what, what we're talking about is um, a few highly educated people um, who have the advantage of being able to travel around and look at various ideas and, and, and look at data. And, and for me, one of the interesting things about the Anthropocene is that we are living at a time where we can see our planet as never before. We can actually see in real time planetary changes. We can make predictions about um, temperature, about weather, um, uh, about soil acidity or um, aridity, all these sorts of things um, that people on the ground, um, they, they can't predict. They can't predict in, in, in nearly the same way. So I really think... Um, it needs to be a time of greater communication and, and, um, and working together, really. Okay, um, any other questions? Uh, okay, I have, I have one question, so, and it's, it's related in a way. Um, so on, on your travels, um, was there an awareness of the concept of the Anthropocene, probably low, low awareness, but was, was there any awareness of the, 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 this debate going on in the scientific community about these ideas? Um, and second question is, was there an awareness of, you know, humanity as this sort of global force um, and this sort of br broader global change affecting livelihoods at, um, at that uh, micro level or local level? So, yes, there is a much greater awareness of um, climate change. I, I thought, um, well, a, a much greater acceptance of climate change in the global south and um, Again, it's, it's political, obviously, everything, um, everything is political, but um, so in a lot of ways, things that were not directly related to climate change would be blamed on climate change. Um, but there is, there is a, a direct appreciation of climate change because, they, because people see it, they, they're much more upfront against it. Um, in terms of environmental change, 
I think it's hard when you are when you're one person living in your own area and you don't um, you don't you don't move further away. So you only have experience of your area and you see that change. And yes, they experience environmental change massively, massive environmental change. But whether there's an awareness, I don't think there's an awareness that this is a global situation um, rather than just affecting their place. And, it's, and it affects people disproportionately in, in a lot of areas. And, and that's, to do with, that's to do with equity, you know? There's, there's plenty of places which have, um, which have less environmental change, and they will be quite often owned by people that um, come from outside. Thanks. Nick. Guy, I'm afraid your rather optimistic viewpoint has made me much more gloomy. Uh -oh. <laughs> because... <laughs> I've been thinking about it. You know, the latest prediction is, is 11 billion for the maximum population. Well, well it does change. It yeah. changes. It changes. Yeah, it's, going so 11, it's going up. It's not going down. Between 9 and 11. I mean, between, it, yeah, yeah, but the latest, latest one's 11. And that's a lot. It's almost double. And energy's not going to be free. Energy's going to be more expensive. And water resources are going to be going down. Well, so you're not, you, so really your, your very uh, optimistic one made me think, well, no, it's not, there's going to be a crunch. There's going to be a major, you know, it seems to me, it's very hard for me to say that this sort of measure will really save uh, humanity. There'll, there'll probably be some really drastic and nasty sorting out, to, which, will, which if things work well will mean there'll be a population of a billion or so sometime late towards the end of the century. But it, I don't think it's going to happen in an, in an easy, friendly way. Huh? Okay, I don't think there will be a population. I don't know, obviously, but I don't think there will be a population of just a billion by the end of this century, unless there's a cataclysmic event, like um, a big epidemic, pandemic that wipes out a lot of people, or, um, you know, um, a massive volcanic eruption. I, or, you know, I mean, there are obviously scenarios. I think our environmental degradation um, has great potential to, um, to make quality of life very poor for a lot of people and certainly puts a lot of lives in danger. But I also think that we innovate and um, we innovate technologically but also socially and there are lots of things that you can't predict. And when I say we might have free energy, this is an example of something which, which I don't think we can predict but could be a massive game changer. There are a lot of things that could be a massive game changer. Um, and that's one of them, you know, um, and that means that water is not the problem it was, but we still face other issues, you know, um, how, how are we all going to live together in cities, um, who's going to be rich, who's going to be poor, those sorts of, I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not downplaying the crises we face, but I don't think, for me, I don't think it's helpful um, to be very pessimistic because... Um, I'm a naturally optimistic person, and because, and because I think that I think that there is there is so much potential for us coming out of this in a good way. And I've been around the world and seen some really horrific things, so <laughs> I'm still optimistic. <laughs> I just want to be sure people are clear. Wolfgang Lutz, who I just met with this morning, and I've written on his work for years at IASA, right in Luxembourg, right out here. Um, his projections are for the, the year 2300. There'll be, there could be two to three billion prosperous people. Uh, no one is saying that that's possible by 2100. Uh, but just, just to give you a tiny little fragment of what getting girls through, through secondary school in Africa means the difference in Nigeria between a Nigeria later in the century with 300 million people or 750 million people. That little tweak, obviously Boko Haram is not making that easy right now. But governance, you know, working, so just that one thing, getting girls through high school, yeah, is the difference between 300 million and 750 million Nigerians. I, I'll, just, um, I'll just add to that. I'm, I'm asked quite often um, if, if human population is the big problem. And yes, we have a huge population with the big, largest number of big animals that's ever existed on the planet. And that's extraordinary. And, and the next in line are the animals that we've created through breeding to serve us, you know, cows, chickens, etc. So, so yes, that, that's uh, the root of the issue. But, but population acceleration is actually going down. And in a lot of places, that's the big worry that um, Japan or... Um, 
I think Austria as well. Um, they, they have a problem in that they, they, they're facing um, a population crisis of, um, you know, an aging population, not enough young, I mean, young people. Obviously, there's a solution to this called migration, but no one's going to talk about that. But, um, but, but population is already sorting itself out as, as nations get richer. Um, the population already comes down, and there is enough. I think there is enough. There, there, there are enough resources. There are ways of feeding um, and um, producing enough water and so on for a large population for 10, for 11 billion. I think there are. It's just, you know, how are we going to live in that? Are we going to live um, vastly using more resources than than we should, or are we going to find low resource ways of living? Okay, thank, thank you. And uh, on that um, uh, relatively positive note, um, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Gaia for a uh, fantastic talk. Um,